Thomas Morton's letter detailing developments in England was exaggerated, but his threats were far from idle. Pushed by Gorges and Laud, King Charles had begun to push back against the colony, hard, and events of 1634 occurred against a background of increasing fear of royal intrusion. This episode will discuss that issue and a series of land disputes with the French, Dutch, and Plymouth settlers as Massachusetts decided to expand its boundaries to support its growing population. You're listening to the American History Podcast with Sarah Tungsalvala, the show exploring who we are and why by tracing American history from the 17th century to the 20th. As 1634 began... Laud was at the head of a new committee to investigate the Massachusetts Bay Colony's activities. He was alarmed by the sharp increase of Puritan emigrants, and another member of the committee, who was based in Suffolk, expressed the concern that the exodus would result in an increase in Puritan thought in England, as well as damage to English trade, trade being the strongest basis of the country's economy, because its own citizens would be competing against it. The new committee wasn't just examining New England, though that was its emphasis. It would also investigate the activities of the rest of England's colonies. Massachusetts Bay was only one of many destinations of the mass Puritan exodus, and by the end of the decade, only a quarter of emigres had ended up there. Some went to Virginia, others to Maryland, a new Catholic colony founded the year before with a high level of religious tolerance, others to the Low Countries, and many, many others to the Caribbean. They helped found Barbados and Antigua, and had created another extremely politically motivated colony on Providence Island. Apart from Roanoke, Providence Island's easily the most important failed colony in British history, and we'll do a series on it in a couple months. That said, for the time being, the Privy Council's concerns rested squarely on Massachusetts, and Massachusetts' biggest threat came from London. In February, as the committee worked, the Privy Council stopped 12 ships bound for New England, and the council demanded that the shipmasters appear before Laud's committee, to give an account of the passengers and provisions aboard each ship. Then, they ordered Craddock to produce the charter before the ships could be released. At this point, Craddock had no choice. He told the council he didn't have the document because it had been transported to New England. A week later, the ships were released, but with an order, saying that because the board saw the frequency and quantity of people leaving for New England, and because those people were known to be hostile to both the civil and ecclesiastical government in England, the king needed to act. And he needed the charter, but because the ships were already in the Thames, ready to set sail, stopping them would be too dramatic and damaging an action. So the ships could go, but Craddock must bring the charter back. And even bigger change that resulted from Laud's investigation, though, was the creation of a permanent commission for regulating plantations with Laud at its head. This new commission would have the authority to regulate all plantations, call in all patents, make laws, raise tithes, remove and punish governors, hear legal cases, and inflict all punishments in the colony, And if five or more commissioners found that the colonists had wrongfully obtained their land or that they were planning rebellion against England or that they were on the verge of full separation from England or its church, the commission could require the colonists to disperse either to other colonies or back to England. In addition, the commission ordered the Lord Warden of the East Anglian and Kentish port towns, known as the Sink Ports and Haven Ports, to help slow the excessive and disorderly emigration. This was essentially a worst-case scenario. The king was preparing to take over, there could be no doubt. Morton, Charles, and Laud had all essentially said so. 
The colonists were ordered to return the charter, but doing so most likely meant having the charter revoked. Even if it didn't, it meant the end of the autonomy the colony had been operating under and increased scrutiny by the crown. The colony's biggest enemies, Laud and likely Gorges, would be the people with the final say over its affairs, and there would be no more political experimentation, no more meticulous selection of colonists, and no more separation from Church of England rituals. And worst of all, there would be no more model society. Massachusetts would become like any other English colony, a hodgepodge of varying beliefs and identities, with Puritans perhaps guiding it, but no longer crafting it into a model for all of Protestant Europe to follow. They would most likely be able to live in peace, but their vision and their intention would be lost. In Massachusetts, they needed to decide how to react to this news. They could still minimize the damage, and the question was how to do that while continuing to work toward the colony's goals. The very thing that made the king so quick to scrutinize the Massachusetts Bay Colony was the colony's best hope of doing this. The political climate in England and Scotland was extremely tense, and While this made the king more afraid of the potential damage a colony could inflict, it also meant that the king's attention couldn't remain on an American colony for long, especially if the colony remained relatively quiet. They couldn't afford to lose the charter, so they stalled. They responded to Craddock, saying that the document could only be released by a vote of the colony's general court, And the next general court simply refused to consider the issue. That put the issue on the back burner for the next few months, and it allowed the colony to deal with its other pressing issues, most importantly, a massive influx of people. And it also gives us a chance to discuss the second major thing that was going on in 1634, which was expansion to accommodate those people they had to start looking for more places to settle. And this would bring them into conflict with other groups in the region, including Plymouth. The first altercation occurred with Plymouth settlers up in Maine. The Pilgrims had a grant from the Grant Patentees of New England, giving them the exclusive right to trade at Kennebec. And Kennebec was one of the colony's most profitable trading posts meaning that it was one of the ones helping to pay off most of the colony's debt. Interestingly, they seem to also have been friendly with some Jesuit missionaries who were evangelizing in the region. In spring, one of Captain Wiggins' Pascataqua men named John Hawking sailed to Kennebec in a pinnace belonging to Lord Say and Brooke, and two of Plymouth's magistrates told him to stop. He refused, and then he moved his ship to a location where he could cut off Plymouth's trading vessels, and he put down his anchors. In response, John Howland, who was at the time the head of Plymouth's trade at Kennebec, took a small group of people to meet Hawking and reiterate the Plymouth colony's demands. And when Hawking again refused, Howland ordered his men to cut Hawking's anchor cables. After his men had cut one cable, Hawking drew a gun and said he'd kill whoever cut the other. Howland jumped to the rail of Hawking's boat, saying, they're only obeying my orders, so shoot me instead of them. But when one of the Plymouth men cut the cable anyway, Hawking shot him dead. Then, another Plymouth man immediately shot and killed Hawking. We don't know who shot him, because the pilgrims protected his identity even years after the altercation. When news of the event reached Boston, Dudley and Winthrop wrote to Lord Say and Brooke to ask what to do, and the lords replied that they'd like to see some of the Massachusetts magistrates join Captain Wigan to see justice done. 
The Puritans at Pascatawqua were allies of the Massachusetts settlers, and Say and Brooke, who owned the Pascatawqua colony, were also Puritan leaders back in England. So Massachusetts was already inclined to side with Pascatawqua anyway, and they obeyed Say and Brooke. A couple weeks later, when Alden went to Boston on a totally unrelated trip, officials arrested him. He was the highest-ranking Plymouth official present in Kennebec, and they didn't know who had fired the fatal shot. They put him in jail while Massachusetts wrote to Plymouth and asked whether the colony was willing to punish the man who had killed Hawking. Standish went to Boston to demand Alden's release, but Massachusetts magistrates refused and insisted on a full hearing of the case. Bradford and Winslow then went to Boston with their pastor, Ralph Smith, to put forward their case and discuss their trading rights with Massachusetts pastors, Cotton and Wilson. Pascatawqua didn't send any representatives at all, and Massachusetts simply represented them. Bradford and Winslow noted that Plymouth had a grant for exclusive trading privileges in Kennebec and that they'd been using it consistently. Kennebec was one of their most profitable posts, and that had even been where they had first learned to use wampum. They noted that Hawking had killed the first man and that he could have killed more if their man hadn't killed him. In light of the recent altercation, Bradford and Winslow wanted to know if their rights would be recognized, and if Massachusetts would recognize their right to defend their trading rights, including to the death. They acknowledged that they had been guilty of breaking the Sixth Commandment, and that they'd hazarded another man's life for their rights and material well-being, and they said they would be careful not to do that in the future and that their man had been reprimanded, but they emphasized that they were far from the only wrong ones in the situation. Bradford and Winslow's arguments were pretty indisputable. It was clear that Plymouth owned Kennebec, and they could strongly argue that the shooting was a matter of self-defense. So Alden was released, and Plymouth's rights were recognized, and they continued using the post until 1661. The Plymouth settlers soon found themselves in another dispute over a trading post, this time with the French, and this time they were looking to Massachusetts for help. Isaac Allerton was in charge of the post at Penobscot, but a group of French traders took it over, killing two of the five men Allerton had left there when they resisted, and kidnapping the rest as well as taking all of the goods at the post when he arrived. Allerton took a pinnace to demand the goods and his men, but the French leader claimed the goods as his lawful prize, saying that he had authority from the King of France, allowing him to attack and dispossess any Englishman trading east of Pemaquid. Allerton asked to see the man's commission, and the French leader responded that his sword was his commission when he had the strength to overcome resistance. Plymouth hired a ship called the Hope of Ipswich to push the French out, offering its captain, Richard Gerling, 200 pounds if he succeeded. The French had already fortified the post, though, and Gerling didn't have enough men or ammunition to displace them, so he went to Boston to ask for help. The court there asked Plymouth to send representatives to come discuss the issue, And when Thomas Prince and Miles Standish arrived, they announced that they would help Plymouth as friends, but that they wouldn't treat the post as an issue of the common good. After Standish and Prince left, Massachusetts leaders decided not to give the men or supplies at all, and Gerling was forced to return to Plymouth to say that the post couldn't be recovered. The Puritans later reached out to the French at Penobscot and asked if they intended to expand beyond Pemaquid, and the French responded that the English ambassador had set Pemaquid as the limit of peaceful French expansion in New England. The issue had been settled by an international treaty, and they wouldn't go beyond its limits. Another area that the Massachusetts settlers were interested in expanding to was Long Island, 
where the Earl of Stirling had an English patent. When they went to stake their claim, though, the Dutch governor of the Hudson River Plantation invited them to a meeting where he politely told them that the land was rightfully his. They showed him their commission, and he showed them his. The matter would have to be settled between the English king and the Dutch lords. The king wasn't likely to enter diplomatic negotiations to support Massachusetts' expansion, so the settlers gave up and went back to Boston. Maine might have been useful for trade, and Long Island may have been attractive, but it was a no-go. The real gem of the area, though, was Connecticut. It was the best trading location around, and it had lots of fertile land. This was the place that Massachusetts had its eye on. Samuel Hall and John Oldham took the lead in exploration. The Plymouth settlers had learned about Connecticut from the Dutch, and they'd been quietly building up a trading post there without announcing it to the Bay Colony inhabitants. They knew they didn't have any official right to the land, and they wouldn't fight people with contesting claims, but their economy had only been stabilized by trade, and they wanted to maintain a significant presence in the region. And Connecticut was a particularly good location to conduct trade both locally and with places like Virginia and the Caribbean. So Plymouth had bought some land there from the Indians and hoped that they could assert some claim over it when the time came. The inhabitants of Newtown and Watertown were particularly interested in the area. They were running out of space, and more importantly, Newtown's preacher was starting to conflict strongly with Boston's John Cotton, especially on governmental issues like limiting suffrage. They wanted some distance separating them from Cotton's influence. So in the fall of 1634, they petitioned for the right to move to Connecticut, and the issue became the subject of a multi-day debate. Newtown residents argued that they were running out of space for their population, and that the land around the river was fertile enough that it would soon be claimed by someone, either Dutch or English. So by planting, they would help reserve the country for the Puritans. Opponents of the move argued that it was important for the colony to remain one body, seeking the welfare of the whole, and that as weak as they were when united, they'd be in danger if they split up. That would discourage future colonists and leave those who left particularly vulnerable to threats from the Dutch, Indians, and King alike. The Pequots owned the Connecticut area, and there had been no meetings with the tribe since Stone's murder. If they wanted to move, it would be best if they simply joined a larger Massachusetts town. Dudley was one of the six people to vote in favor of the Newtown residents' move, but Winthrop and Cotton led a much stronger opposition, and Newtown wasn't allowed to relocate. Massachusetts leadership did start working to smooth relations with the Pequots, though. It was a prerequisite to safe expansion, so in late October they met with the Pequots to discuss the murder of Captain Stone and to negotiate peace and trade. The Pequots were equally eager for peace, as the Puritans were far too numerous and strong to afford as an enemy. They already had tense relations with the Dutch, and they were facing pressure from other native tribes, so they sent ambassadors to meet. First, the Puritans demanded justice for Stone's murder, specifically that the Pequots kill the people responsible for the murder as a prerequisite to negotiations. According to the Puritan version of events, which they got from the friendly Indians, the Pequots had assassinated the captain and his crew while they were sleeping and then plundered and burned his ship. The Pequots responded that Stone's murder had been in response to his kidnapping of two braves who had boarded his ship to trade peacefully. They said that the sachem who had been responsible for the murder had been killed in a conflict with the Dutch, and that all but two of the remaining killers had died in the recent smallpox epidemic. 
one which had also hit the residents of Plymouth in Massachusetts. The tribe agreed to hand over the two survivors, as well as granting the Puritans as much of the Connecticut Valley as they wanted, plus paying them 400 fathoms of wampum and giving them 40 beaver and 30 otter skins. Plus, they agreed to open a permanent trade and ask for a military alliance. The Puritans accepted their explanation in their offer, minus the military alliance, and signed a treaty in November. The terms were fantastic, and the Pequot account of Stone's death didn't seem too far-fetched. The next spring, though, Oldham went to trade in Pequot territory and returned very cynical about the possibility of fair and honest trade with the tribe. The remaining murderers were never surrendered, and the Pequots only paid part of what they'd offered. A disappointing result, perhaps, but for now, peace was the most important thing. As 1634 came to a close, the main threat to the colony remained, though, and that was the potential revoking of the charter and imposition of a governor from England. They'd already been concerned about the violent confrontation in Kennebec, but that seemed to blow over. The real problem was that Massachusetts was now a colony populated by thousands of people who had left England because of strongly held beliefs, but who didn't fully agree with each other. And one of the biggest disagreements was how much they should compromise to preserve the safety of the colony. This had been a question in Massachusetts since day one, and tensions with the king had galvanized both sides. Was making a few compromises worth it for the long-term benefit of a colony that could help Protestantism everywhere? Or was compromising with heretics fundamentally wrong and unacceptable in any situation? There were sizable groups on both sides of the issue, and at the latter group's head was Roger Williams. Now pastor of the Salem Church, Williams was sending admonishing letters to Massachusetts' other churches, accusing the magistrates of heinous offenses and alleging that the only pure church in Massachusetts was his own. He had separated completely from the Church of England, whereas they wouldn't. In fact, to make complete work of it, Williams had separated from his own wife, refusing to ask blessings or give thanks at meals where she was present, because she attended public worship he disapproved of. In his speech and correspondence, Williams also personally applied verses from the Book of Revelation to the king and openly challenged the king's authority to grant a charter. This is exactly the kind of attention Massachusetts didn't want to attract, the kind of attention which made them look like a threat to England's stability, religious and political radicals who were against both bishop and king alike. That December, the general court discussed William's behavior and ruled that his arguments were erroneous. But, he continued, Winthrop personally asked Williams to stop discussing the issues, saying it was, at best, imprudent, and he said that he admired William's fervor, but this simply wasn't the time. John Endicott tended to agree with Williams' no-compromise approach, though, and in November, he took Williams' provocation a step further when he cut the St. George Cross from the Salem Militia's royal ensign. Endicott explained that the Red Cross had been given to the crown by the Pope as a sign of victory and that, therefore, it was a superstitious thing, an idol, and a relic of the Antichrist and that therefore it was not proper for Christian magistrates to temporize or compromise with evil. This could easily be the event which finalized the king's decision to act against the colony. And some people didn't even agree that the cross had been idolatrous. Hooker and Dudley, for instance, said that the Reformation had weaned people from the idolatrous uses of the cross, so it was fine to use them. They were just things and nothing worth provoking a fight with the king over and jeopardizing everything. 
Plus, some of the soldiers were refusing to march with the defaced royal colors. Many people fundamentally agreed with Endicott's actions, and among them, a decision had to be made. Was it necessary or needlessly provocative? Winthrop and Cotton agreed that the cross was idolatrous, but they said that the action was, quote, giving occasion to the state of England to think ill of us. The fall court couldn't decide what to do, and they left the issue to the next general court in May. At that point, the general court came down hard on Endicott. They sentenced him for his rashness, uncharitableness, indiscretion, and exceeding the limits of his commission. They noted that he hadn't voiced his concerns to the colony's authorities, and they barred him from holding office for a year. Then they scrutinized his use of the public money while in office. He protested, but they rejected his request and decided that the flag would continue to fly over Boston Harbor's Castle William, where incoming ships could see it. But they conceded that the Salem militia could drill with a new flag that didn't incorporate the cross. The timing and trauma of Endicott's action made it one of the most iconic moments in early New England history. And it didn't go unnoticed in England. Thanks for listening. If you have any opinions, thoughts, or theories about anything we've discussed in the show, I'd love to hear from you either on Facebook or Twitter. And you can find those links at the website, AmericanHistoryPodcast.net, as well as links to firsthand accounts and things. See you next week.